Hey boys and girls, your old friend Jim here once again, and I want to share with you something quite a bit different than anything else I've ever had in my collection before. Uh, the knife that you're seeing in front of you is called the Blue Max. It's made by a gentleman named Jerry Moen. Uh, you can visit his website at moencustomknives.com. He's also on Instagram. Um, but what's crazy about this knife, it may look like any number of other carbon fiber scaled flippers that I've had on my channel in the past. Beautiful detail work, nice blue titanium going all the way through it, nice clean titanium pivot, titanium hardware, really, really nice blade shape on this, great finishing, but what, what sets this apart is the fact that these are not carbon fiber scales. Matter of fact, both sides are solid carbon fiber using no titanium liners nothing else inside the only components here that are not carbon fiber in the handle are the pivot the three screws here the back spine and the clip and of course your lock now it's not a standard liner lock either because you'll notice again there are no liners the handles are pure carbon fiber what he's done is something that I feel is rather unique in the way that he set that lock. I want to call it more of a, a sub-lock than anything else because it really almost has its own category. But before we get into that, let's talk about the basics. This is one of the lightest weight knives I've ever owned anywhere near its size. What you've got is a three and three quarter inch blade, yet the whole knife only weighs three and a half ounces. Yeah, it's mind-boggling. Uh, to, to give you some perspective on that, most of the tactical style flippers I own in a three and three quarter inch blade are anywhere from five and a half to seven ounces in weight, typically. There are a couple that are a little bit lighter, but not by much. Certainly nothing that comes anywhere within the range of three and a half ounces. And that's because of those handles. Not only did he do something great with creating the whole handle of the knife in carbon fiber, but he's also perfectly contoured it as well. Everything is rounded off. You've got a nice contour from top to bottom. No sharp edges anywhere on that handle whatsoever. Another thing that I love is the way that he's made it all of the, the few materials that are here. So you'll notice that the back side of the blade is perfectly contoured to match the exact shape of the frame. Little details like that that we don't see in every custom knife, certainly not in the, the low price range this one is in, and one that always impresses me and jumps out at me when we do see it. You'll also notice as we get some nice tight shots here that it is some of the most flawless carbon fiber in the world. This is actually made for auto racing. It's, it's a specific type of carbon fiber that's being used in auto racing. It's not available through knife supplies like Alpha Knife Supply or USA Knife Maker or, or Ghost Carbon Fiber or any place that you choose to buy carbon fiber from. And the reason he went this route was he had placed orders with other places for their carbon fiber and found that the surface finish wasn't as nice and that he had a lot of voids that he would have to sit down and fill. And you talk to any knife maker that works with carbon fiber. Besides the dust issue, uh, one of the things that they hate the most about it is having to sit down and fill voids if they don't have perfect selections of carbon fiber. And what he's getting here is absolutely without flaw. It's also got a nice shimmer to it when the light bounces off of it. So it may not be as, I don't want to say exotic, but you guys know I have a particular love of marbled carbon fiber. This has one of the properties that I really love in marble carbon fiber, which is that sheen and the light just dancing off of it. Inside, you're running a cage bearing system and a ceramic detent. Now, I had the chance to go hang out with Jerry in his Dallas, Texas shop uh, just yesterday, as a matter of fact. 
and we just upgraded my knife a little bit. He took it apart and he went ahead and put ceramic bearings in there for me, which makes it even smoother uh, than it was already. Now this is back to being a fresh build, so my lock is just a tiny little bit sticky uh, because we did, I, I, I don't mean we as in I did any work, but uh, while I was standing there, he cut down my lock tab a little bit for me because it used to protrude quite a bit and he's making that alteration now for all of the future models where it, it almost completely disappears into the frame and it's a really, really nice setup. So what you've got here is the very first time that Jerry has made his way into the tactical folding knife arena. Let's, let's kind of back things up a little bit and talk about what makes this knife special and what makes it being a tactical flipper special for him. Uh, I'm going to pull up a couple of pictures here because I had a chance to take some pictures in his shop when I was there and these are just sitting here on my uh, on my Instagram. You guys can always follow me if you want to. Here is the interior of the knife. So as you see there are no liners whatsoever. Here's part of your backbone, your back spacer. There's your lock and there of course is going to be your pivot, your bearings and the uh, stop pin. Now as we go into a larger shot here, you can see it a little bit better. This is what makes everything so interesting. You have a lock that cannot fall out of place. It's not screwed in, it's not bolted in. Because you got to realize if you're not doing a liner lock, which would be that basically that spring lock coming up off of a titanium liner, you're not doing a frame lock where the entire side of the knife is cut out and then uh, made to move as the lock. If you're going to do a subframe lock of some sort, like what uh, Todd Begg does, what Tony Marfione does, and a few other makers, uh, you have to take your lock material and you're going to bolt it somehow into the frame. Well, what he's done, and I actually tried turning it like it was the knife. Uh, sorry about that. He has actually dovetailed that lock directly into a massive pocket inside of the carbon fiber. So the result is a lock that isn't going to move. You don't have to worry about um, the, the structural strength of it or anything else because it is locked in there. When he took my knife apart and had to pull this out, he basically had to take this side, put it, I think he had put it into a vise, I don't remember. Uh, he may have held it with his hand, but he had to tap this out very, very hard with a hammer, uh, a hammer and a punch to get that to loosen, to pop out of the pocket that it's dovetailed into. It's a brilliant little design. Now, this is not the first time somebody has made a full carbon fiber handle in a folder, but there are not many that have been done and very few makers that have even attempted it. And what he's done here, he's done right. It's a joy to have. It flips really, really well. It's slim. It's slender. It's really comfortable in the hand, but more so, it's comfortable in the pocket. Because of that slim nature and because of the lightweight, it makes it a really great choice for EDC. So all the carbon fiber is contoured, all the components are titanium, you've got a really nice finish here on the blade, I'll give you a nice close up there, that nice dark acid stone wash finish there. Satin flats, there is Jerry's logo there with the uh, mountain peaks, and there is the Blue Max logo. Uh, for those wondering what Blue Max is all about, the knife was named to commemorate Jerry's longtime friend, Raymond Beetle. Uh, Beetle was the driver and owner of the Blue Max funny car, arguably the most famous funny car that's ever been in existence. Uh, Beetle won three consecutive NHRA funny car championships between 79 and 81. He then won uh, three IHRA funny car championships from 75, 76, and then in 81. Uh, Beetle also owned uh, a NASCAR Winston Cup Series team from 83 to 90, and in, I want to say it was 89, it's really hard to do this stuff by memory, guys, I apologize, uh, should have been 89 Winston Cup Series championship uh, with Rusty Wallace driving his car. This is the commemoration to his memory because, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Beetle passed in October of last year. Uh, he and Jerry were very, very, very close friends. He spent years just hanging around in Jerry's shop uh, while Jerry was working and doing stuff. And he was a really important part of Jerry's life. 
one of the things that I find interesting about Jerry is that he defines himself by those that he chooses to share his life with. The relationships that he's built throughout his life seem to me a lot seem to be a lot more important to him than money, notoriety, or his own personal accomplishments. And it seems like everybody that he shares his circle with is, is kind of of that, that same type of mentality. It was really nice to spend some time with him. I spent the good majority of the day yesterday in his shop. And when I bought this knife uh, three weeks ago, I actually got it from Jerry himself at a knife show that was being done here locally in Dallas, Texas. And that was the first time I got a chance to meet him, and I was just blown away by, by so much about him. Basically, his story is, uh, after retiring from 30 years, yeah, wow, God, 30 years in the Texas oil industry, Jerry decided one day to sit down and teach himself how to make knives. How crazy is that? Completely self-taught. Um, he's loved knives all of his life, so with his knowledge of many things mechanical, he decided to buy some equipment and just sit down and start making knives. One of the things that Jerry enjoys most uh, is opening up his shop here in Dallas to people who have a passion for knives. Whether you are a maker, you want to be a maker, or you're like me and just really love knives and love the, uh, the collecting aspect of it and all the details that go into it. He loves to share his knowledge with anyone who wants to learn. Now, his focus has mainly been in classic gentlemen's folders, bird and trout knives, slip joints, small fixed blades, uh, and knives like that. The Blue Max, as I mentioned before, was the first time he's uh, kind of dipped his toe into the pool of the tactical folding segment. And at the Blade Show, when he went there uh, a few weeks ago, every single Blue Max he brought sold out. Uh, when Mike from Keybar got his, he bought the large one, which is this, and the small one, which is a three-inch blade. He started posting about it. People went nuts, started ordering as many as they could from Jerry. Uh, when I got mine, I started posting. He got a lot more followers, and again, people started going nuts trying to get them. And he closed his books. He's going to be changing the way that he's going to be selling his knives in the future because he can't possibly meet the demand. I mean, this is a knife that's about, what, what was it, $650? Holy shit. I mean, just wrap your mind around that. A full custom knife, not a mid-tech, not a production, made in a rather unique manner with a lot of work and a lot of engineering that went into it. And it's under $700. And it's one that's so comfortable and so easy to carry that it's going to kick a lot of other knives out of your pocket. Yeah, he's really done a great job. Look at that action. Holy shit. I mean, seriously. Boop. Really nice detent. Super smooth action. And I haven't even broken it back in yet from having the new bearings put in and everything. Uh, another thing that you should really know about Jerry is he's earned a high degree of respect from his peers and other makers. Uh, he's also a director in the Knife Makers Guild. It is I mean, it's such a huge honor for someone uh, that enjoys making knives to be accepted into the guild. It's a very, very, very big deal. And a lot of people listen to what Jerry says. As a matter of fact, he played a big part in helping to unify the guild and the ABS, which is the American Blades, uh, excuse me, American Bladesmith Society, um, two completely different factions that didn't always see eye to eye, uh, if you want to look at it that way. And what he's done is he was an integral part of bringing those two organizations together and create a new knife show that's never been done before. So it's called the ICCE, the International Custom Cutlery Exposition. Whew, there's a mouthful. And that's where members from both groups, representing some of the most legendary names in the knife industry, are going to be coming together under one roof, open to the public. It's going to be an incredible show. Um, it's in mid-September in Kansas City. I want to say it's the weekend of the 18th of uh, 2015. So you're definitely going to want to check that out. If, if there was a single legendary living knife maker that you can think of, he's on that exhibitor's list. It's one of the biggest exhibitor's lists that I've ever seen. And it's not set up like a flea market. This is going to be a pretty high-profile event. And I'm going to do everything within my power to make sure that I'm there that weekend as well. That's not too far from where I live in Dallas. So, yeah, what the hell, right? 
Alright, so as to overall impressions on the knife, uh, good and bad. There's not a lot of bad. The only bad that I really could have come out with this was the original tab that was right here for the lock. Uh, it was very large, very squared off, and it was really, really rough on the finger. And from the very first time I picked it up, uh, I didn't mention that to Jerry. And he says, yep, I'm looking at different ways of working around that. And one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to shave it down, and I'm going to kind of dehorn it, take the corners off of them. He says, so if, if you have any issues with yours whatsoever, you're a local, you're welcome to come down to my shop, and I'll just take care of it for you. And it really did. It took him less than five minutes to rectify that issue. Uh, now I've got something that's a lot easier to work with. And really, there was nothing else that I would have changed. Um, slight design thing just for me, just because of the way it jumps out to my eye. The flipper tab is really, really big. Uh, very similar to what you would see Elliot do over at Ferrum Forge. It's very big and there's no jimping. Now, you don't really need any jimping because he doesn't have a super rock hard detent on this, but it's a detent that's perfect for getting it to rock it open, and it does. It's a very, very fast, very smooth knife. If it were me, I'd probably have it about half the height that it is, and maybe a little ramp going that way with a little bit of jimping on it. Just so you had, boom, just a nice little protrusion there instead of a big one. But it's not really in the way. Remember, you're carrying this tip up, so that's not in the way of anything that's in your pocket. It's not going to snag on anything or anything like that. So it's just a very minor thing for me. I love the backspacer work. Take a good look at that. It's completely flush and done in a gear pattern. Nice high polish on the titanium there. Jerry says he prefers to take his anodized components to a, a nice high polish because it brings out a richer color when he goes to anodize them. And he certainly did bring out a delicious royal blue. You guys know I've kind of gone back and forth with different makers trying to nail this blue in some of my knives and only a couple of guys have been able to do it. I've gotten pale blue and sky blue and these weird blues and only a couple of times with Frank Fisher, uh, Jim Burke and now Mr. Jerry Moen have nailed the blue that I personally love. Now before you go emailing him and begging him, oh man I just saw that knife and can you do one you know, with green anodizing and purple anodizing? He's not going to do that. This was made to commemorate his friend. That's why it's called the Blue Max, not the Pink Max or the Green Max. So please do keep that in mind. However, I'm fairly certain that he's going to be making new models at some point and then there may be some uh, room for variations. I've had a chance to look at, not really handle uh, more than a couple, but look at some of the uh, gentleman's folders that he's done. And you guys know that's not my particular interest. The level of workmanship and the detail and the glass smoothness, remember those were knives that were built before people started really putting bearings into their knives, is mind-boggling. And I'm really excited to see as he evolves as a tactical knife designer, where he's going to go from there. I've already said to him, I said, listen, looking at the amazing work that I've seen you do on your other knives, I would love to see you start doing some really dressy, really fancy uh, folders, you know, of tactical flippers and whatnot. You know, mirror polish finishes and uh, hand rub satin and inlays and things like that. So keep your eyes out because he definitely has a lot of tricks up his sleeve that he's going to be incorporating into his tactical line. He's not giving up on his classics, but he is going to be focusing quite a bit on his tactical line because it is a, uh, it's an exciting segment. And one of the things that he noted was that the customer is a much more excitable customer. The people that he had a chance to meet at the Blade Show was not the typical slip joint customer, you know, which may be, uh, in my opinion, and I could be wrong about this, generally going to be somebody that's a little bit older, 50s, 60s and older, um, that really buy a lot of those knives. And they're probably not quite as excitable as the 20-year-old, uh, 30-year-old crowd that really seems to uh, hang out in the uh, tactical folding segment. So what I'll tell you is this. You will be able to get knives from him in the future. Right now his books are closed, but he's a really super nice guy. And one of the one of the people that I could say that I had an instant respect for once I sat down and had my first conversation with him. Um, there's a lot of people that I like. 
and there are uh, very few that I actually have a great amount of respect for, and Jerry is now absolutely one of them, and I plan to spend a lot of time with him as long as he can tolerate my goofy ass. But he's one of those kind of guys that he doesn't want to say no. So the very moment that he has the ability not to say no, he's going to put you in. And I think he's going to work out a way to sell his knives in a way that um, there's a lot less luck involved and there's a lot less waiting involved. You won't be sitting on a list for two or three years. So keep your eyes out uh, on his website and on his Instagram, which I will go ahead and pull up right now because I just want to make sure I'm giving it to you properly. Uh, it will be, and here it is right here. I'm just going to put that right up there. Boom, boom, boom. At Moen Custom Knives. So go follow him on Instagram. I've kind of talked him into being a little bit more active out there and letting people see the work that he does. The other thing that I love about this is the clip. Look at that. Blind screwed, so it's screwed in from the inside, even though there's very, very little material here. He's able to hide everything. And it's made to flow with the nice, smooth, swooping shapes of the handle. These are all, again, all bent by him, all, all cut by him. Everything's done by him in his shop. He is a one-man shop. This is one that when you get a chance to hold it, it's going to blow your mind. It's going to take your breath away. Just feeling the lightweightness of it, the slimness, yet it doesn't feel dainty. And I want to make that clear. This does not feel like a lot of slim, lightweight knives might. It doesn't feel dainty. It still feels tough. All right, guys, I got to get out of here before my camera cuts me off. I'm getting to the 22-minute mark here in a second. So thank you all, as always, for watching. I really, really greatly appreciate it. And stay tuned because I've got a lot more videos coming your way.